Okay, I was also uh, asked if I could go through number five in internal loads. Um, so let me do that. Uh, so number five in internal loads looks like this. You have a fixed joint on the left side connected to a wall, a beam going out to the right, and then you have this triangular distributed load like that. And the information we're given about the triangular distributed load is um, that at its highest point, um, it has a magnitude of 15,000 newtons per meter. And we're given that the length of this beam is one and a half meters. And we want to calculate the internal loads. Um, well, the first thing that I'm going to do, uh, and you'll see why this comes in handy later, is to represent the height of this distributed load as a function of x. Okay, and I'm going to call that function Q. Um, so the height of the distributed load as a function of x. Um, I'm just, you know, going to, I know that, I know that this is a line, right? You can see that's a linear function. So I know it has to fit this pattern x equals zero is always the left side. And so this b is going to be zero in this case. And so all we have to do is come up with the slope. And uh, we can see that this distributed load rises to a height of 15,000 over a distance of 1.5. So 15,000 divided by 1.5 uh, x, and so that's 10,000 x. Okay. And I'm going to call that function q. Okay. And when I draw this free body diagram, you'll see why, why we need to know that function. Um, so now I'll first draw free body, uh, okay, uh, are we going to need um, yeah, so I'm going to just sort of set this aside for now. I, the first thing we're going to have to do is calculate those external loads, but I'm going to come back to that uh, function that represents the height of the distributed load. So I'll do a free body diagram of the whole thing. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, first, I'll leave that distributed load in there. And uh, what other loads are acting besides this? Um, that's a fixed joint at the left. So we know that there's a force vector that we're going to have to figure out. And we know that there's a reaction couple. I'll call that M reaction. OK. And before we can do calculations, now that we've chosen what we want to isolate, um, we have to represent that distributed load as a point force. Okay, so I'm going to redraw this free body diagram. Uh, we still have these two. And now I'm going to represent this distributed load as a point force. Well, uh, the magnitude of that distributed load is the area of that shape. So the area is base times height over two. <coughs> uh, so the base is 1.5. The height is 15,000 over two. And so that is um, two, let's see. Uh, what's this? Uh, one, two, three, four. 
Um, so this is 2.25 times 10 to the fourth divided by two. And so that area is 1.125 times 10 to the fourth. And if you do the units, it comes out in newtons, which is what we want for a force. And then the location we know is two thirds of the way uh, across. So it's gonna be one meter from the left end, half a meter from the right end. And so I can write this as, um, uh, 11,250 newtons and uh, this distance here is one meter. Okay. And now uh, Newton's second law says this R vector plus zero, negative 11,250 is equal to zeros. Uh, so that lets us calculate that reaction force. R is equal to zero, positive 11,250. That's Newton's. And then the moment equation, uh, I'll put my about point at the left end. Um, so rotational Newton's second law, uh, R doesn't produce a moment about the left end. Uh, we do have MR. Um, and then we have a moment arm of one meter, a force of 11,250. And that would make this rotate uh, clockwise around that point. So that's negative. Those add up to zero. So MR is equal to 11,250. And that's Newton meters. And now I can do the cuts. Okay, so let's think about how many cuts we're gonna have here. Um, so the requirements for when these sub-functions of these internal loads change is you either have point forces or point couples, or you have distributed load functions changing. In this case, in between the two endpoints, there are no point forces, no point couples, no point torques. Uh, and the distributed load function is the same over the whole thing. You see this, uh, this function Q is 10,000 X over the entire length. So between the two endpoints, there are no places where the subfunctions are gonna change. And that means that we can just do one cut that represents the whole body, okay? Uh, we're just gonna do one cut in between the two endpoints and that's gonna be it. Okay, so. Cut one then represents all X's from zero to 1.5, okay? Because there weren't any places that we had to change our free body diagram. Uh, so let me draw a free body diagram that represents this cut. And so notice that here's what we're skipping is this dotted line, okay? And on our cut, we have this much of the distributed load. Notice that we're skipping all this part of the distributed load. Okay, so just the black is the part of the distributed load that we care about. Uh, and then we have this force vector here that we calculated, it's an upward 11,250. And then we have this couple that we calculated is also 11,250, that's in Newton meters though. And then we have the internal loads. 
there's the tension, shear force, bending moment. There's no torques anywhere, so I'm just going to leave the torques off of this. But if you went through the full process and calculated the torque, you'd get, you know, you're adding up zero plus an internal torque, you get an internal torque of zero. So um, if there aren't any, if there aren't any things producing torques, if there aren't any external torques, then you don't have to calculate that. Uh, the difficulty here, so what we need to do to calculate these internal loads is um, we need to calculate the area of that distributed load and the, um, and the centroid of that shape. Okay, then we can represent it as a point force. The difficulty is we don't know the height of this triangle. And the reason we don't know the height of that triangle is we don't know a numeric value for this length, okay? This is just x, okay? And as x changes, the height of that changes. So what we're gonna do is represent the height of that triangle in terms of x. And the way we can do that, do, so do we have a representation of the height of this triangle as a function of x? Yes, that's that q that we calculated. That's this function q that, that I did right away to start this. Okay, so what's the height of this triangle here? The height of that triangle is 10,000 X. Okay, so now that we know that, we can calculate, you know, to get the magnitude of that force, we need the area of that triangle. That's base times height over two, so that's uh, x base times height, 10,000 x over two. And so you get 5,000, uh, I'm out of room. So for that area, you get 5,000 x squared. Okay. And then for the centroid location, it's two thirds of the way from the left to the right. So that's just gonna be two X over three. And so now I'm gonna redraw this free body diagram um, with this uh, distributed load represented as a point force. Now it's important to know that you can't represent the distributed load as a point force until you've chosen what body you're gonna isolate. Uh, so like, for example, notice that if we used the point force representation of the whole distributed load, okay, that says that you'd have an 11,250 Newton force a meter from the left. That wouldn't show up at all on this cut, okay? So, and that, that would give you a different answer, or a wrong answer. So what we have to do is first you make the cut, draw the distributed load, and then, now that you've made the cut, then you can represent that distributed load as a point force. Okay, so what do we have? We have the um, reactions. So that's 11,250. And we have the couple, that's 11,250. And now we have the point force with a magnitude of 5,000 X squared, and it's acting two thirds of the way to the right end. Okay, so this distance here is two X over three. And then we have the internal loads. All right, and then now it's just like the other stuff that we've done. We just have this thing that's a function of x. So Newton's second law says uh, zero, 11,250 plus zero, this is in the negative y direction, so zero, negative 5,000 x squared.
plus T zero plus zero negative V, I'll lump those together. And so you get an internal tension at zero, an internal shear force that's a function, and uh, we got negative 5,000 X squared um, plus 11,250. Now the moment equation, so rotational Newton second law, uh, this is going to be the about point at the left. And so uh, what produces moments around that about point? Well, the couple does 11,250. Now, as so does this 5,000 X squared force, that is a moment arm of 2X over 3. So there's the moment arm. Uh, the magnitude of the force is 5,000 X squared. Um, that would produce a clockwise moment, so that's negative. And then you have plus M minus VX is equal to zero. Um, get M by itself. So M is equal to um, so we have so I'm going to do this multiplication uh, that's and I moved it over to the other side. So that's uh, 10,000 X cubed divided by three. So that's three, 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 three dot three, three, three forever um, X cubed. Uh, then we have uh, minus 11,250. Then we have plus Vx, which, and we know that V is represented by this function. So that's minus 5,000 x squared times another x, x cubed, plus 11,250x. And now just combine all this stuff and you get that M is equal to, um, so combine the X cubed terms, you get negative one, six, 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 six repeating X cubed um, plus 11,250 x minus 11,250 and that's it you have your three functions um, these in this case we only had to make one cut so this these three functions are valid on the interval um, x between 0 and 1.5 uh, and one thing that I'm going to talk about next time is it turns out there's derivative relationships that you can use to check your functions. Um, if you take the derivative of m with respect to x, it always has to give you v. Um, so take the derivative of this first term, you get negative 5,000 x squared. That term works out. Derivative of the second term of m you get 11,250, that term works out. This one derivative is zero. So that gives you a little confidence that you didn't make any dumb mistakes as you were going through this calculation. Okay, uh, so that's it for number five. Let me know if you have any questions. Talk to you soon.